Hey, No Budget Audience. I am talking today with Paul Harney of That's That Productions. He is a producer of the show Wicklow County Matters, uh, The Hat Show for Irish TV, and he made a fantastic documentary called Underestimated. You got it right. Yeah, I wrote it down. I know. That's I told really... you <laughs> like two minutes ago. <laughs> well, and what's impressive is if I got your name right, because yeah. usually I mess up everybody's names. That's good. Um, so what we're going to talk about, though, uh, we're kind of changing the way we do the interview a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what I'd really like to talk about is, since you have so much experience in television and doing interviews, mm -hmm. is let's talk about doing interviews, because okay. you're such an expert at it. You, yeah. you sort of interviewed me, mm -hmm. um, and now it's my turn to return the favor. Okay. And so as somebody who's probably interviewed, how many people have you, would you say you've interviewed over the years? Well, 112 shows multiplied by, on average, say, three people per show, so three, 350, 400, okay. maybe more. So that's a good, mm -hmm. good crowd. Mm -hmm. um, when, you're, when you're sitting down with somebody, what do you do to kind of loosen them up a little bit? Yeah, you to... have to break the ice, mm -hmm. extremely important. I'll start out, like, you have to get there early, number one, and you have to do as much research as possible, but mm -hmm. if you're on a low budget, that mightn't be just might be you know out of your reach to do that so like how when we just sat down and i was like tell me bit, of course. that's bad or no no that's okay that's good? okay i met you before yeah so that's different okay. but if i hadn't known you and you were like okay tell me i'd be like oh, geez, tell me what? <laughs> who are you you know what i mean so you just have to make it a, oh you know were you working today or oh what's the grow your kids are in school you're trying to get common ground like you know, i have children so if i'm interviewing anyone i think it might be an age bracket of those kids i'll talk about kids okay you know if i'm interviewing someone who is a you know a young guy or a young girl i'll try and talk about something fun you know what your habits social media just get a feel for how lively they are you know and pretty soon i'll ascertain like okay they can talk that's fine that's no problem mm -hmm. just put them at ease just and say ignore the camera ignore the lights because i never have any lights because there's no budget <laughs> ignore the camera and you know if i have emily my presenter with me mm -hmm. it'll be fine i can just you know point them towards her but if it's me interviewing just off camera then you just need to make them aware that there's no camera there you're having a conversation it's just a two and a fro okay. a little bit of a chat back and forth how do you deal with um because I've, I've had the experiences where i'll be talking with somebody mm -hmm. before before this camera starts rolling and it's great and then as soon as you hit that record button they're suddenly like and oh because you know, they're really conscious yeah. of what they're saying yeah. suddenly no that's tricky so what you do is that the first trick is like okay okay look obviously if this is a you know this, it's not that easy for you to go and talk on camera these are not easy things to do so look i just won't record this at all mm -hmm. you know this is just a we'll try forget about the camera the camera's off this time there's no pressure and we're literally just doing a rehearsal they relax a little bit 50 percent of the time it might work you could be okay if that doesn't work you really just have to go back to bed okay let's just take it there's no just forget about time no constraints let's just sit down again and go back to back to tactic one mm -hmm. get to know them loosen them up like go through the answers a little bit like tell stories of other people oh, you wouldn't believe it i interviewed a politician once and he was absolutely terrible total lies mm -hmm. but you know you just he was appalling you wouldn't believe it like and you know i wouldn't mind but he was talking about nonsense he didn't even enjoy you're talking about something like your life your job your events so right. it's really important you're connecting with your audience here now think about all the people you're going to help by giving this little bit of a talk about the hospice or whatever the community hall or whatever kind of thing it is and that you know tends to work too and then you just go back and then after that chat right we'll leave the camera off again as i discussed before unless just you and me have a run through mm. and then obviously the camera's rolling the whole time <laughs> you know it never stops right you don't tell them that always it's, roll that's the thing them. as well like just you know when you're interviewing someone don't be starting to stop them if you have the card space of course and the battery part right. let it go Mm -hmm. Let it go if you think you're a bit nervy, because if you are, oh, 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 you know, it can kind of throw things off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good advice. Mm. Um, what do you do then in that scenario if you're interviewing the person, let's say politician or mm -hmm. something, and you you just can't relate to what yeah. they're talking about, or you really don't give a crap? You know, <sighs> it's tricky because politicians and people like that, they they have their script. They yeah. do this the whole time. The only guy I interviewed who went off script and was unique and, and interesting was um, Stephen Donnelly, mm -hmm. ex, uh, oh God, what was his party? Social, was he Social Democrats, but now he's independent again. He was great. He just went off script, talked to us, you know, off camera, was very, very loose. But other guys, they're just so stuck in their ways. There's no point even trying. It's just like, yeah, yeah, great, great, great. Yeah, go. <laughs> oh, well, what a sound. Bye, bye, next, forget about Let it. Let them do their talking yeah, points. No, there's no, there's no, that was just, mm -hmm. you know, it, I never wanted to interview those guys. They just came along. They'd appear. Oh yeah, well Mary told me to come down. So here we are. Blah blah blah. I'm like, Bleh. Oh jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when um, so as a producer mm. of, of your show, what's how do you go about getting interviews? Like, do you have somebody that's responsible for doing that? Or no, 
Mm -hmm. But just to point out the show that I produce, it's 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 finished now because yeah. Irish well, TV. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah I'm thinking like a Wicklow County Matters. Yeah, that's for gone. Like, mm -hmm. they, Irish TV have wound up now. They've, you know, they've like screwed a lot of people. Basically, mm. the companies wound up. They owe a lot of money to a lot of producers. So this is all kind of recent past experience I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But in terms of that, the budget was it was small. You know, it was yeah. manageable but small. So in terms of research. If things were going good on my company side of things and I have a budget, I might outsource a bit of research to someone else, I might get my presenter to do, it, but for the 80% of the time, it was just me. Okay. So the way that would go, because we focus on the Wicklow area, we try and tap up the same person again. I try and locate the, the motor mount of the area. That's a bit of a bad term. The, by motor mount, I mean the, the, the go-to person in the community. That's a better phrase. Okay. I'd locate them and figure out, like, get them on the show, you know, and they would cultivate other stories and they know other businesses, they'd have other little nuggets and just hit them up again. Befriend them on Facebook, get them on social media mm -hmm. and keep them going there and just be, keep, you know, keep it ticking over, send them shows, keep them, you know, aware the show was on and mm -hmm. they would feedback stuff as well. That, social media news outlets, like any Wicklow news-based websites, um, of course, press as well, mm -hmm. and newspapers, the usual kind of channels, but you have to read them, research them and just keep your ear out. And also, yeah, I used to arrive in locations needing to get a half an hour content, mm -hmm. and I'd only have 10 minutes planned. So you've got to think on your feet. So when we interviewed you guys here that day, mm -hmm. we just created half a show by just elongating it, stretching it, and throwing different questions into the mix. Mm -hmm. And that same day, we had a cancellation, so we ended up going over to the convention center in Dublin and interviewing um, a church, someone about a charity Emily had been involved in, and mm -hmm. we stretched that out to half as well. And also, you might note the show was called Wicklow Matters. Mm -hmm. It was a Dublin show. Yeah. We mm -hmm. used the hook that Adrian was, you know, from Bray, and you know, that was the whole thing. Total lies, like because it's mm -hmm. television at the end of the day. So you have to, when you're on a tight budget, you have to be able to bend the truth a little bit because you can on the medium of TV. Because at the end of the day, you know, people aren't really going to question what they see. Yeah, but no, most parts, you know, especially for lifestyle kind of lighthearted stuff like. Yeah, what it, we're doing. for um, along those lines though, because I did you, along uh, with the with the interview that you did with myself mm. and Adrian or the other one, because I've watched a few of your mm. um, uh, clips online. Uh, when you are doing the interviews, they do tend to go a bit longer. Yep. You edit it down. Like, explain kind of your editing process, because I, I did really like the way that you edit some of the stuff. Because an interview, just us sitting here talking and yep. somebody watching, they might think that's kind of boring. Yeah. And so the way you edited it a little bit kind of helps make it a little more interesting. Um, what's some ways that people can kind of edit an interview to make okay. it a little more visually engaging? Okay. Well, pen. If you're shooting online, mm -hmm. ideally you have two cameras. Even if you're on your own, if you have two cameras, if one is not lack, if one is lacking in quality, do your best to bump it up in the edit. Get to know your equipment. If you've got a big lens one and a small lens one, learn to get them as close as possible. Have your settings off by heart, so you just set your two cameras up. That gives you the flexibility then to cut correctly, mm -hmm. because you can cut away the crap. You can put sentences together. You can create things from nothing. You know, it becomes a bit of a work of fiction then if you've got the two cameras. Mm -hmm. As long as you ask enough questions, then when you sit down, two cameras is, is key. If you don't have the two cameras set up and you're relying on one, your B-roll has to be solid. You need to have enough cutaways and enough cover shots to make up for the moment when the person will just stop, blank. Uh, you have to be able to stitch together. Mm -hmm. If you're interviewing someone about, um, let me see, about working in a fruit and veg shop, then obviously you get all the fruit and veg stuff. That, that's fine, you have the stuff there. If you're interviewing someone in their house and they're talking about possibly losing a loved one in a car crash or something bad like that, and you don't have any, obviously, footage of a car crash, you gotta get them to make tea, you gotta get them to walk outside, you gotta get them to put a bin out, and if you're on a, a tight schedule, it might be possible to get your settings down on the camera, so you just need to know your equipment, know your camera, and know what you require for each different interview. Tragic, loss, bereavement, charity push, anything like that, shots around the home. Stuff that people are gonna be happy to do and be able to do quickly, you know? Just repetition what they do in normal everyday life. If it's the two camera setup again, and you know you have that security in the bank, then it's all about your questions. You can literally go with the questions a little bit longer, and you'll know yourself as camera's rolling, okay, look, this is, this is going good. I can cut that bit there, mental note, take a notebook if needs be, you know, just jot it all down. But you get used to it after time, the more you do. Ah, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and maybe talk about some of your filmmaking. Cool. Sound good? You were just telling an interesting story there during the break. Yeah. 
that I think would be kind of useful for our audience. Okay, so let's uh, any budding journalists out there or people that want to get into this line of work, location is a big thing. You know, if you want to go and shoot somewhere with a controllable environment, it can be difficult. You mightn't have money to rent a studio. You mightn't have money to rent a hotel. It's all into budget at the end of the day. It's very hard to go into a place and get a quiet setting. So once, for example, I had to interview a man um, about, we won't talk about the topic, but I had to interview someone and I didn't want to drive to where he lived because it wasn't in County Wicklow. I didn't have budget to go that far. So I invited him to a really cool property that um, a friend of mine let me use from time to time. This is what I told him. Mm -hmm. It was actually my place. Hmm. So he had no problem with doing that because he was working for a charity called Sea Change. So he came out to the location. I obviously just kept it as a location, so I knew this is my home. I knew it was going to be quiet in the day. I knew how to make the tea. I knew where the kettle was. I knew where I'd get the nice shots outside. I knew I could just get my nice big armchair and light the living room up. And he came out. He was interviewed in the house. The interview was wrapped in an hour and a half. It was brilliant because I could relax him so much because it was my home. Mm -hmm. And he just, you know, he was just enjoying being in a, you know, being in a nice enough place and with no distractions. So it was fantastic. We did, it was the best interview I did in 2016 by far because it was a very serious subject matter about mental health. Mm -hmm. And this guy had been through a lot, a Canadian guy called Rick Rossiter, he'd been through a lot. And as I said, best interview of the year. And the best thing about it was the European Championships was on. And I wanted to watch Italy, Sweden. So we wrapped, <laughs> we wrapped, he left and the game started. Nice. Brilliant. So I just sat there with cameras, tripods, mics, Put the game on, had a beer, mm -hmm. happy days. There you go, audience. If you want to watch a match, <laughs> do the interview at home. But it, it's a good lesson, though, to, yeah. to, to the, in what you were saying. So you create, you create a space. If you, if you can always find a space somewhere mm -hmm. I, I, if you need to do an interview. And you can make that space work. So mm -hmm. you took pictures of yourself down so that he didn't have to see pictures of yeah. you and that type, type of yeah. stuff to make it more uh, of a... A Home. professional thing. Yeah, exactly. But professional too, because I didn't want to say, come to my house. Yeah. Now, as it turns out, he was such a nice guy, he wouldn't have given a damn. He would have mm -hmm. said, no problem. But I, I didn't know that because I'd only spoke to him. So it just had to be a location I could borrow and I'd use from time to time to do these interviews. Of course I hadn't. That's great. But you know, it made good TV. Uh, okay, well, let's jump into some of your filmmaking. Uh, okay, well. Uh, talk about the documentary, The, the, the uh, Underestimated. Made a documentary. I cut my teeth, really, in 2011 with a documentary that myself and my my friend Dermot made about the uh, drum and bass scene in Dublin. Because I was a drum and bass and jungle DJ for, still am like at the time, mm -hmm. for years. So I knew that subculture, I knew that scene really well. And like, you know, the age old adage, like Roberto Rodriguez says, if you want to start, start in something that you love, something you know about and something you have access to. So I knew a lot of people in the scene. I knew I had access to the clubs. I knew I could get their stories out. So we picked about eight, eight people, I think it was. And we just kind of cross-referenced the stories about how it was very, very tough to put on nights in a kind of a musical subgenre in a city like Dublin because mm -hmm. jungle and drum bass would be on the extreme fringes, house music and techno, they always got the big venues, the big crowds, you know, the sponsorship and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I where I began with, with documentary making. And then did, when you were talking to people, was it mostly friends and people that you knew? It was friends and people yeah. that I knew, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then through that we got some like bigger DJs who were actually playing at gigs that, you know, nice. friends kind of organised interviews there to give it a bit of a kind of a more international kind of appeal you know so we got that show and we what we did was we as a, a thank you to everyone who got involved we rented the Denzel cinema mm -hmm. and we gave a screening to everyone that featured and they were you know we got a very good reception yeah with especially with documentaries I think and a piece of advice for people is don't be afraid to go <laughs> don't be afraid to use your no budget money <laughs> Uh, don't be afraid to kind of go up and uh, talk to people and basically say, "Hey, I'm I'm working on this. Uh, can I talk to you?" Yeah. You know, in in that kind of a scenario, especially because you were able to relate to them yeah. and say, you know, I know now where you're coming from, so mm. they know that you're not gonna, you're not trying to do something to make them look bad. Yeah. You're you're doing something because you find it interesting and you can relate to it, yeah. and, and it makes it that much better. Um, where can people see the documentary if they want uh, to? You just type in underestimated drum and bass history on YouTube, you get it there, or my company YouTube page that, for That's That Productions. <laughs> nice. But you can link from it, that's that.ie. That's that. I will yes. throw a link into the. Ah, cool. uh, the yeah. Let's talk about um, now that Irish TV is yep. closing down, yep. how did that come about? Okay, how did that come about? Irish TV. 
they had one financial backer mm -hmm. from the get-go and he pumped a lot of cash in and something happened and he decided to split from the project. So he split at the end of October and we were all sent a uniform email, you know, seesaw production at the moment that unfortunately this has happened and we're, we're going to try and get new sponsorship on board but we kind of knew it was curtains. So unfortunately a lot of people are owed a lot of money mm -hmm. and the communication with the company has been absolutely abysmal you know it's been absolutely terrible so what's going to happen is, is there a cutoff date like well they, they, date they, and... it's been in the courts now and they're, they're going to be liquidated so i think that's happening at this moment in time so is we, there a possibility that it might get bought up by some other company or one would think with that plan I, I don't know i don't know if it's sustainable on satellite television like i mean i'm not the one to come up with the business model but yeah it did seem a little bit out there to try and you know compete with the big boys in ireland like rge tv3 with their budgets and whatnot yeah. it always seemed to me more of a perfect uh, platform for online hmm. so i don't know perhaps maybe they got a little bit greedy and thought we'll take over the world when they should just build a big online platform and, and capitalize that way like i'd love to see it going in some form yeah. or other but I, I do think that unfortunately now they've tarnished the name because they they owe so many people so much oh, money and they bad. treated people in a very bad way oh not good mm -hmm. <laughs> so but look i mean a lot of people myself included mm -hmm. got so much experience mm -hmm. from that platform learned so much met so much fantastic people along the way you know we wouldn't change that at all and you know they did pay us you know, but they yeah. didn't pay us for this. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's very, very sad that it had to end in that way. But, you know, that's life. You've got to deal with the punches. When's your last day? Uh, do, you, do you guys know what uh, what's the cutoff date? Oh, we're gone. Oh, really? Oh, oh, really? Yeah. oh, oh I yeah. thought it was like here in a... No, 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 oh, no. Oh, really? No. Oh. I had two shows in the can mm -hmm. that, um, <clears throat> that I didn't bother to send in because there was no point and I was owed for five. Oh, wow. Some people were owed going back September. Other uh, people for full series. I think outside broadcast owed too. <laughs> the, just the list, you know. Well, that's so great. As I said, a lot of a lot of anger. But there's also out of this anger, I would imagine there's going to be a lot of creative frustration, mm -hmm. ready to crack on. Like I noticed, you know, Martin Connolly from Loud and then the Grace from Kildare, and you know, other people are really, really getting stuck in. What else are you working on then? What are you working on now? Yeah, I'm working going? on a few side projects at the moment. Um, I'm working on a documentary, which I can't really talk about because mm -hmm. of uh, confidentiality reasons. Mm -hmm. And I still have a few you know, major kind of TV series plans that I've worked at negotiation stages with BA Idol. I hope to get across the line in the next year and a half. And lots of corporate work too, you know? Perfect. Because I have a family, so I need to... You know, we have to get the Make bills some money. first, you know, unfortunately bills bills first, creativity second at this stage of my of my career. No, I understand. Yeah. I, as much as I uh, hate taking corporate work, it does. Oh, pay, yeah, of course. You yeah. know. Uh, okay, well, let's wrap it up. Yeah. Last, uh, where can people find you if they uh, want to track you down for any reason? Uh, Facebook, Paul Harney, Facebook, that's that productions, that's that dot IE. Mm -hmm. That's where you get me. That's that. That's that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, thanks for coming down. Cool, man. Thank you very much. All right.